for those of you who uh, have not signed up yet for the uh, free medical checkup, uh, please do so. It's a, a great ministry that they're offering to our, our group. Uh, so if you are a foreigner and uh, you haven't gotten one of these checkups in a while, it's a very, very nice checkup, a very expensive checkup, but uh, they're offering it for free. So if you have not gotten uh, some kind of annual checkup before, uh, please take advantage. I think, is a sign-up sheet in the back? Yeah. Okay, so there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You can go and sign up uh, after service, and I think uh, there are still some spots available. Okay, why don't we pray together and we'll go into our message for today. Lord, we just ask that uh, today as we, as we talk about the resurrection, as we talk about the empty tomb, uh, Lord, would you give us new eyes to see this, new ears to hear. Uh, God, we pray that this gospel truth we penetrate our hearts and bring new life to us, revival to our hearts. So we pray for that right now. We pray that our hearts will be revived as we hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't think it's too much to say that remembering well is one of the most important things uh, that we can do in our lives. Remembering well is one of the most important spiritual disciplines uh, that we can do as Christians. Have you ever been in an argument and in the middle of your argument you tell the person, you always say this and you always do that. Now, is that really true? No, it's not. Usually when we say you always do this or you always say that, uh, Aren't we just remembering what we want to remember? We're just remembering the times that they did that, but do they always do that? Do they always say that? Usually, no. Uh, it's something that we say with our selective memory. Also, they say that we're much more likely to remember how someone has hurt us than to actually remember how someone has blessed us. So someone can do a thousand nice things to you, be generous and kind to you many, many, many times, but if they hurt you one or two times, uh, they say that actually we'll, we'll tend to remember those one or two times more than all the other nice and kind and generous things that they did to us. And this has uh, been studied in, in research and clinically proven to be true. We tend to remember the bad things that people do to us, not the good things. And I mentioned last week, uh, some of you who were here, I mentioned that on the special days, on, on, on anniversaries and on birthdays, when I'm writing cards for my wife, uh, one of the great things about those moments is that I have to remember again why she's so great. I have to think about why, why is it that I married her? Why, why is it, what is it about her that is so special? And I have to think about that and I'm reminded again. And when I do that, I see her more clearly. Right? I see her as she truly is. Study after study have shown that the happiest people are not the people who have the most. The happiest people are the ones who see what they already have differently. If I went around this neighborhood in Pundang or Yatha, and I went around and I asked people, if I asked the people in this neighborhood, uh, what do you tend to remember the best? What, what sticks in your mind? The, the good things in your life or the bad things? What, what do you tend to focus on? What do you, what do you tend to dwell on? The, the positive things in your life or the negative? I would probably find that those who remember the positive things more in their life, uh, well, this is kind of obvious, but, but they would be much happier than the people who tend to focus on the negative things in their lives. Remembering is so important, uh, just how we see everything. How you remember, it shapes how you think. It, it shapes even your identity. Because who you are as a person is largely dependent upon what you remember about your life. 
That is largely who you are as a human being. You are a collection of remembered memories. And the things that you've forgotten tend to be not even part of who you are. Maybe in your subconscious, but for the most part, who you are is based on what you remember about your life. What you choose to remember, and maybe what you don't choose to remember, but you just remember. So, it's no surprise that when we look at the Bible, the Bible is constantly talking about remembering. <clears throat> if you look at the Old Testament, God is constantly telling the Israelite people, His people, He's saying, tell your children what I did in Egypt. Tell them all the time, make sure they never forget how I did this miracle and that miracle. Don't let them forget that I rescued them from Egypt. And he tells them many, many times, build a monument for me, build a physical monument out of stones, so that every time the Israelite people look at that stone pillar, they remember what I did. They remember that I was faithful. And the Psalms, if you read the Psalms, the Psalms are filled with songs about remembering God's faithfulness. Remember how He did this for you. Remember how He rescued you. Remember how He was good to you. If you go to the New Testament, in the New Testament you have Jesus. And Jesus is constantly repeating and quoting from the Old Testament. And the Jewish people, they know the Old Testament. They know these verses. But Jesus is reminding them, remember, this is the Word of God. Remember that this is what God said. And here, in our passage today, we have the Apostle Paul. In verse 1, what does he say? He says, Now I would remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Now, look at this. He said, he already preached this gospel. Right? This is a gospel that he already preached to them. They already received it, right? They have received this gospel. And look at what it says in verse 3, too. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, which is what the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. Right? So, looking at this, he's reminding them of something they've already been preached to about, something they've already received, and Paul is saying this is of first importance, this gospel. Now think about this for a moment. Uh, there was no internet back then. There were no phones. There were no cars. Uh, if you wanted to communicate with someone, it was very, very slow. You had to give a letter to somebody, and that person had to walk, or go on a horse or a mule, and it took days to get to their location. Right? So letters were very, very hard to send. Communication was not easy. And it was very valuable. To send one letter to a distant location, I mean, that person has to sleep somewhere, that person has to eat things to get to that location, so it was a very expensive process to send just one letter. And so for the Apostle Paul to say anything to anyone, it took a huge amount of energy and effort, right? It is not, you know, we think of email or kaka, right? It's so easy to send a message to someone, right? It's instant. We just use our fingers. Uh, but think about how valuable each word is when it takes days for it to get there. Right? We, we take advantage of how fast we can say something. With the Apostle Paul, to say even one word, it is extremely valuable. So what would you not want to do with your letter? You don't want to waste any space. If you're writing a letter to someone and it's going to take days or weeks or months to get there, you are making sure that every word counts. Every word matters. But for the Apostle Paul, the Gospel was important enough. Not just important enough, but of first importance. Primary importance. That he repeated it even though they already knew it. Even though they had already received it. He said, I must remind you again, because it is of primary importance that I say this in this letter. This expensive, valuable, very precious letter, but it's worth every word. 
The gospel is Christ died for you. He paid the price for your sins. He rescued you. He switched places with you. And He rose again so that one day you would have a future hope, an eternal hope, and that you would dwell forever with our Father in the new heaven and the new earth. This is the gospel. This is what Paul is talking about here. I wonder, I wonder if some of you get, get sick of me reminding you every week because you know, I, I make a very intentional effort to talk about the gospel in some form, as clearly as I can, every week. I, I make sure that I say something about the gospel. And I know some of you are, are sick of it, like, oh, he, okay, there he goes again, he's talking about the cross, he's talking about the resurrection. And maybe it's almost kind of predictable that I'm going to go into this. But I will never stop reminding you, because it is of first importance. If it was important enough for Paul to send a letter to the church that would take days and weeks to get there and talk about the gospel, then it's important enough for me to talk about it every week. Now, why is the gospel so important? You see, if I preach about patience and generosity, if I tell you guys, you guys need to grow in your patience and your generosity, but I don't talk about the gospel. That's like building a house without a foundation. The gospel is the foundation for every other teaching. It is so easy to hear some kind of teaching about behavioral change, even if it's about love, even if teaching is you need to love more, but there's no gospel, you will twist it in some way. If the foundation isn't there, that house is not stable. That house is not going to stand. Living in the knowledge of how radical God's love is for you and understanding how evil and sinful your sin is, that is where you need to start with everything. You need to start from that foundation every time. So you shouldn't be building any kind of... So let me, let me make this very clear for you. In your spiritual growth, when you think about how am I spiritually growing, do not take any step in your spiritual growth unless it is grounded in the gospel. Don't learn anything about God unless it has been filtered through the gospel because any teaching, any knowledge that you receive about God can be twisted. You can use it to be more prideful. You can use it to feel like you can earn your salvation. You can use it to judge other people. The gospel protects you from all of that. A church member once asked a well-known pastor, uh, I've talked about it before, John Piper. Uh, he's one of uh, the people that I really look up to as a spiritual mentor. But John Piper, he, he once was asked by a church member, what should I say to a Christian who wears revealing clothes? Right, what should I say to a Christian woman uh, who doesn't seem to dress modestly? And I love what John Piper said. He said this, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to quote this word for word, so just listen carefully as I quote this. He said, my approach was never to start with the rules or the guidelines, but to start with God and the gospel and the Bible and the spirit and faith and joy. Deep things need to happen in a woman and a man's soul before they have any chance of thinking and feeling about these things in a way that honors God. I will say, I will just say this to any woman, any man who dresses inappropriately. Until God has become your treasure, treasure, until your own sin has become the thing you hate most, until the Word of God is your supreme authority that you feel to be more precious than gold, sweeter than honey, until the gospel of Christ's death in your place is the most precious news in the world to you, until you have learned to deny yourself short-term pleasures for the sake of long-term joy and holiness until you have grown to love the Holy Spirit and long for His fruit more than man's praise until you count everything as lost compared to the supreme value of knowing Christ. Your attitude towards your clothing and your appearance will be controlled by forces that don't honor Christ. Do you see that? He says, I don't, I don't focus on the rules. I don't tell them what to wear. Why? Because I can tell them, don't, don't wear that. And they will do it for all the wrong reasons. They will not do it because 
Jesus is their greatest treasure. They will do it because they're being forced to, or they will do it because they have some other motive, but it won't be in a way that honors Christ. Is how we dress important? Yes, very much so. Uh, this is our outer garment. You know, when the world looks at us and other people look at us, this is what they see. This, what you wear has influence. Right? The way you dress will impact people. And as Christians, it's important. We should, this is part of our witness, right? Our words are a witness. The way we dress also is a witness. It's a visual representation. But the pastor is clear. He would never start by saying, you must dress this way. He starts with the gospel. And he says, is Jesus your treasure? Do you treasure Jesus more than anything else? Until God has become your treasure, any behavioral changes you make, even the most spiritual kind, let's say you go on missions for Jesus, let's say you evangelize for Jesus, let's say you do miracles for Jesus, no matter how good or amazing or powerful, if it is not grounded in the knowledge that God is your greatest treasure, and not grounded in the gospel and what Jesus accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection, then you will be motivated by the wrong things. And you will be corrupted. All that you do will be done for the wrong reasons. You know, as a pastor, I want to make it very clear to you all that this is really all I want for you. Uh, I, may, maybe sometimes it comes across that I want you to act a certain way or do certain things or talk a certain way, but you know, in the end, really, uh, I, don't, I don't care. Because uh, you can be the most well-behaved Christian, but if Jesus is not your treasure, you are in some severe idolatry. You will be in some severe idolatry. You may look nice on the outside, but your heart will be wrong. My goal as a pastor is not to change your behavior. That is not my calling. My calling is not to make sure that you go to church every Sunday. My calling is not to make sure that you read the Bible every week. Yes, I may encourage you to do that, but you can do it for all the wrong reasons, and then I fail. The Gospel says that neither your best efforts at human morality, let's say you're not a Christian and you try your best, or your best efforts at spiritual morality, let's say you are a Christian and you try your best. The Gospel says neither your human morality or your spiritual morality can save you. Only trusting in what Jesus did can save you. That is the only thing that can save you. And the way that Jesus saves us and sometimes we get this wrong, right? Sometimes we think Jesus saves us uh, to be healthy, or Jesus saves us to be comfortable, or Jesus saves us to be successful, but that is not how Jesus saves you. The way that Jesus saves you, saves you is by becoming your Lord and your treasure. So that you are not idolizing your health, you are not idolizing your work, you are not idolizing your reputation, but He becomes your greatest good, and He becomes your Lord and you submit to Him. That is how Jesus saves you. That is salvation. It is not prosperity. Salvation is when Jesus becomes your Lord and your treasure. And all other things fade in comparison. Let's talk about this Gospel that the Apostle Paul thought was important enough to repeat. Uh, it's interesting. He doesn't just say to us, just believe. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, throw out your reason, throw out your mind, throw out your logic, and just blindly believe. He doesn't say that. He starts by presenting evidence. Let me read this for you. This is uh, verses 3 to 8. And he says this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas, who was Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, 
as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Isn't that interesting? He goes through the evidence. First, he gives both the historical and the scriptural evidence, right? He says, Jesus really did die, right? According to scripture. So there's a historical, he died. You can go to that spot. Many of you saw him hanging on that cross, and it's according to scripture. He fulfilled the prophecy. He really was buried, right? You can go to that spot. Some of you saw his body lying in the tomb. And there was a stone that was rolled, rolled across the entrance. You can go there. And that was also according to scripture. And he really was raised from the dead on the third day. And you can go check. That tomb is empty. There's no body in there. You can go. Look, the stone is rolled away. And that is also according to scripture. Historical and scriptural evidence. Uh, for the Jews, the scriptural evidence was very important because they looked at the prophecy for the Messiah. They were waiting to see the one who would fulfill the promises in Scripture. Then he mentioned eyewitnesses, right? He said, all 12 disciples saw him and met him, and then he showed up to over 500 people at the same time. Now, isn't that incredible? I mean, you can kind of, maybe you can say, all right, if he showed up to one or two people, and maybe they could have lied, right? Maybe, maybe they had some kind of motive for making it up. 500 people at the same time? I mean, there's no such thing as a whole group hallucinating. Right? There's no such thing as, you can't have 500 people all dreaming the same thing. That defies belief. And then he says, and if you don't believe me, they're still alive, most of them. Go. Go talk to them. You can, you can ask them about that moment. Over 500 people saw Jesus alive and risen. What Paul is doing here is he is saying there is clear evidence. And think about the disciples. If the disciples did lie, if they somehow stole Jesus' body from that tomb, why would they die for something they know is a lie? There is no, there is no sane or logical or reasonable human being who would ever die for something that they know is a lie. And we know that nearly all the disciples died for their faith. They were martyrs. So clearly, they believed in something so much that they were willing to give their lives for it. And finally, there is the Apostle Paul himself. Everyone knew who he was. Everyone knew this guy. Before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. Right, Saul was uh, the, the, you know, the, the greatest Jew. Right? He was the one who followed all the laws perfectly. He was the one who was you know, the top student. He was the one who was going to be the greatest teacher in the Jewish tradi tradition. But he was also uh, someone who hated the Christian church, someone who was persecuting the church. You know, he talks about it right here. He says, you know, I persecute the church. He confesses it in our scripture today. He was well known in that time. He was a famous figure. And it's hard to explain, it's very hard to explain how someone who hated Christianity enough to want to kill other Christians could become one of its greatest leaders. Someone who wrote most of the New Testament. It's very hard to explain how someone could so radically shift from one to the other. Unless something incredible happened. Today, on Easter, uh, what I want you all to really grasp is that we are not celebrating positive thinking here. We are not here just wanting this to be true. We are not here just saying this is true because this is what we say as Christians. This is not why we're here. We're saying this because it is tangible, historical, concrete, provable, truth. It is a hope that you can examine. It is a hope that was touchable and seeable. This is what we celebrate on Easter. This is why the Apostle Paul lists the evidence. 
He says, our hope is not a blind hope. It is very real. Our hope is a walking, talking person who is risen from the dead. You know, it's amazing that the three most central images of our faith, of our Christian faith, uh, are very physical things. We have the wooden cross. We have the very human Jesus. And we have the empty tomb. And wouldn't you say those are the three central images of our Christian faith? Right? If you think about what is it, what, how can we capture the gospel? Right? It is those three things. Jesus Christ, a human being, the cross made out of wood, the tomb made out of stone. This is our faith. Something you can touch, something you can see, something that is very real and physical. But what is this hope? Sometimes I think we, we confuse what the hope of resurrection is. Uh, but let me just say some things that help us to understand uh, what his hope, the hope that Jesus gives us, does not represent. You see, Jesus never got married. He never had children. Jesus died young. He was never successful in business. He was never part of the elite society. He was not good looking. He was not even always liked. People hated him. Uh, he did not have a lot of money. He was poor. He did not even have a home. He did not have a perfect family. His family sometimes mocked him and uh, judged him. He did not have perfect friends. His friends abandoned him, backstabbed him, betrayed him. And we can say similar things about the disciples. The disciples, they suffered. Some of them were poor. Uh, some of them had broken families. They weren't successful by any standards of that culture either. Now, is it okay to hope in those things? Sure, I, I, I think so. I, I believe so. I believe that family, it's okay to hope in your family. It's okay to hope in your work. It's okay to even hope in money because it is a good thing. These are all good things that God has given us. But if they are life-defining hopes, if without that hope, without the hope that you have in money, without the hope that I have in my appearance, without the hope that I have in my family, or my reputation, or my career, if without that hope, life is not worth living, in a life-defining hope, if that is how you look at those things, then those are false hopes. Those are false hopes. And to ask Jesus, who did not have any of those things, to say, I want these things as life-defining hopes in my life, is to misunderstand what Jesus came for is to misunderstand the hope that he was bringing us. What is the hope that the disciples in Jesus had? What, when you look at the way they live, what is it that you see that is common? What you see is that they looked to die so that others might live. That was their hope. They, that is what they hope to do with their lives. They hope to die. And I'm not just talking about physical death, but dying to themselves so that others would live. That is why they did not hope in any of these other things. They had a very loose hold on all those things. And isn't that so hard? That is very hard. To, to, to die for someone else to die to all of your needs and your dreams and what you want so that someone else would increase and live and prosper. That is fundamentally <coughs> against our most basic desire, which is self-centeredness. And we do not want to do that. But that is how they lived. That was the guiding hope of their lives. And the gospel gives us the power to die to ourselves so that others would live. Because the gospel tells us that death is defeated by a God who loves us so much that He died so that we would live. You see, when you look, when you look at Jesus, 
you see someone who is not afraid of death. When you look at the disciples, you see people who are not afraid of death. See, when death is defeated, then you can live for others. When you are afraid of things dying in your life, my reputation dying, my career dying, my family dying, right? When your fear is centered on those hopes, and you're so afraid of those things dying, the, the, the concept of death, you can't live for others. But when death is defeated, when death no longer scares you, when the death of your family, or your wealth, or your reputation, if any of, the, any of those things, you say, I'm not afraid of that dying. When the gospel gives you the power to stare death in the face in any of its forms, and you can say, I don't need that, that is when you can truly live for others. That is the power of the gospel. Have you ever noticed that Jesus' resurrected body still had the scars of crucifixion? He still had the nail holes. He still had the holes in his feet. He still had the thorn marks and the pierced side. But have you ever noticed that he still has all those scars? But isn't that weird? The, you know, he's supposed to be a perfect body. It's supposed to be a resurrected body, right? Why would there still be scars on a new body? But I think what God is showing us is that the suffering of Jesus is part of his glory. All the pain, all the suffering, he doesn't see it as something to be ashamed of. He sees it as part of his glory. Now our suffering, our pain, the different ways that we die every day. Right? We, we lose things, right? we lose friendships, we lose things we love or dream of, and those are all kinds of deaths, right? Uh, we, we grieve over those. Our pains and our suffering, our, our own deaths, uh, in light of what we see in Jesus, they are no longer signs of hopelessness. They, no, they are no longer signs that God has failed us. That we've lived a meaningless life, that that pain was meaningless, there was no there was no positive aspect to it. You see, when we see that Jesus still had the scars on his body, we see that the power of suffering to break our hope is gone. Because we know that the resurrected, very physical body of Jesus, that is the promised resurrected body. That is the body we will also have. So we no longer fear death. We no longer fear suffering. We're no longer worried that we will lose things. Because we know our destiny, our hope, does not end with any sort of death. Death is defeated. Even the hurt and the wounds, they become part of our glory part of our eternal glory. Church, on Easter, we say that the tomb is empty. We know that there's no body there. What does that mean? It means the tomb, the symbol of death, no longer has the power to hold you. It can't hold you. It cannot define you just as I had no power to hold Jesus. So death, in any of its form, it cannot define who you are as a person. But we don't we do that so often? We say, if I lose this, I don't know who I am anymore. If this becomes something that I can't have, then I don't know if I want to live. If this is gone, then I'm nothing, right? We say that, right? Because why? We are allowing these forms of death to define who we are. We are allowing these deaths to hold us, right? We're captured in that tomb, and we're so afraid. And the message of Easter is, the tomb is empty, and the stone is rolled away, and it can no longer confine us. It can no longer limit us. Yes, we will have scars, because we will lose things. Mm -hmm. You will get hurt. But they will not be marks of failure, they will not be marks of despair or marks of glory. Church, I want you to remember that Jesus, when he rose again, he did not rise up by himself. 
It was not a singular resurrection, but he rose up and pulled all of us with him. Right? You need to understand that. When we, when we look at the story, don't think of it as just Jesus' resurrection, but it is the resurrection of all of us. And so we no longer fear death. We no longer let it define us. The tomb is empty for all of us. Let's pray.